My name is Brianna Ajiman. Power, Molly. Dowie Chow. Crystal Hudson. Julia Lucas. Rob Markman. Victoria Fortune. Daytona Thomas. As time goes by, uh, the younger generation aren't as familiar with MLK outside of knowing that they have a free day off of school. So I do wish that um, content producers and you know people that work in film and television did a better job of breaking the speech down so that younger people um, know Dr. King and his legacy and how that speech is still relevant today. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. You know, I, I think you could say that and every American knows what that is and where that comes from, right? But um, that's just a snippet of the speech. The speech was like 16 minutes long. Like um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was really going in. And, and as much as I think it's important to um, know his dream and work to realize his dream, it, it, it's also important to grasp the totality of, of everything that he was saying in that 16 minute speech and not just the one catchphrase. <laughs> the fact that he was able to say Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants and all these different types of people and their religious beliefs, internal beliefs, we've expanded that into you know, the LGBTQI community. We've expanded that into special needs. We expanded that into mental health. We expanded into him saying encompassing all. That's part of the dream as well. Um, it just has like an addendum to it now. <laughs> America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. You know, what he's saying there is you know, black people are owed, I mean, not just one thing, you know, or something, but many things. Um, and we're owed the same thing that, you know, every white American has assigned to them at birth, effectively. I remember there was one line in the speech where he talks about having a black man in Mississippi having getting the freedom to vote and then a black man in New York having a reason to vote. I don't know the exact words, don't quote me on that. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. He made that speech 60 years ago at this point, and, and we're still kind of feeling those same things um, to this day. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. That's so powerful. <sighs> because when you think about what we went through last year, I made a lot of speeches and I, I helped to organize a lot of protests and, and got together with a lot of youth. And it was beautiful to see how the people got together. 
And it wasn't supposed to be just a moment. This is a way of life. And he was trying to project that, instill that in our people to know that we are out here fighting because we have to. We have to be out here. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. My childhood was like that, and my friends were really diverse, and the change happened when we grew up and systems had me in one place and a black friend in another place and like a harder fight for kids of color than for white kids. But like a dream of a little black boy and a little black girl and a little white boy and a little white girl all being friends like that, that happened, you know? I uh, got to live that. So it kind of removes some of the, the frustration of change not happening, if that is evidence of the change. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. Well, you know, I think the general perception of, uh, of MLK and his, and his um, activism is summed up in sort of those words of, you know, meeting violence with nonviolence, of having a level of dignity and restraint and courage to be able to stand up for yourself, for others, for an entire community, for an entire nation. His success lies in his legacy, in creating something that existed well beyond his life, which was, you know, which was obviously cut short. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Good evening, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second floor hotel room tonight when, according to a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. A lot of times you're not, you're not appreciated for helping others. In Dr. King's stance, he was killed for helping others. And before dying, for that and being killed for that, helping others. He was stabbed, he was spit on, his name was drugged through the media and dirt, rocks thrown at him, you know. Other people that was helping in different ways used to say he was stupid for the nonviolent stance. He took a lot more negativity than people thought <clears throat> and probably that he even shared what we knew about helping others and being, being of service. So you could say, that's what I do and that's who I'm about. I'm a service person. Are you willing to die for that? Because he died for that. When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state, in every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.